Make your way back to your seat. All right, and then everybody else, if you want to grab your Bible, your iPad, your phone, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 25, because that is where we are going to hang out. And while you turn there, you know me, I got a funny story. All right. Uh, By the way, Megan, my wife, said on the live that she loves your shirt. So there you go. Sarah is with us. Uh, This weekend, I went with uh, Pat and Trudy. We went to go teach a church about life languages. And so I got to see the church where where Pat and Trudy pastored at and the sanctuary and stuff like that and all the unique restaurants that exist in this foreign place called Oklahoma. (laughs) And uh, we went past this one restaurant, and I giggled and laughed and cried laughing because there is a restaurant out there called Chunky Dunkers. So yeah, let that be some joy for you today. I can't stop thinking about it or laughing at it. (laughs) I felt like a kid. I was like, Dad, stop, stop, Dad. Pat's like, we're going, because it was a six-hour drive. So uh, yeah, and then you drove 10 miles, and there's Foggy Bottom Restaurant. So I I don't know what's it with Oklahoma and and what they're doing, but it was a good time, and uh, it was great to be with them. And so I'm excited for all you guys We've been doing, or I've been doing a series kind of broken up called Bridezilla. Let's all do that together so I don't feel so weird. One, two, three. Bridezilla. Because right, Christ refers to us as his bride, but sometimes we can fall into being a bridezilla. And how many know that it's not fun to be around a bridezilla? I was a wedding DJ for a while. I know how this feels, and it is not good. We even have that little picture If you were one of these people, which one would you be? I'd be the one on the left of the bride making the weird face. I don't know. But I'm really excited because today is, uh, when we talk about Bridezilla, and as I pray for our congregation, I just really ask, Lord, what do you want to speak to your people? And I really believe that God spoke to me. And uh, it's a good thing I'm funny because some of the times what God gives me, it's not a feel-good message. It's a wonderful, convicting message that I believe reflects the heart of God in it, and it's going to be good. Amen? So raise your right hand. I will not leave till the end of service today. (laughs) So Matthew um, chapter 25, and so this is a parable. So Matthew 24, Jesus starts talking about the end times and, 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 uh, and some prophecy, and then he goes into this parable. And the parable is of the wise and foolish virgins. Or as I'd say, the parable of the brides and the bridezillas. Um, And the first thing that I noted that was kind of crazy is when you think about like us as Christians and how many people say we're Christians and then God gives us these reminders through the word that that means something. And it should mean something to say that I am a Christian. I follow Christ. Christ, right? Amen? Amen. And the first thing I thought about was Jesus is the bridegroom, and this story says the ten, it's the ten virgins. It doesn't say the five perfect virgins and the five ladies who slept around with anything that walked. It said the ten virgins, like we're all Christians. The, you know, I just thought that was interesting to, to note that it was like the ten virgins, the ten, you know, Christians, and when I read that, when I thought about that, it just really was like, wow. This is, this is awesome. So we're going to dive into the first 13 verses. That's the parable. And so I'm going to read it all, and then we're going to go over some things together. Okay? So starting, um, and it's on the screen, uh, starting in verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, and five of them were not the sharpest tools in the shed. Those who were foolish, they took their lamps, and, but they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all of the virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, 
give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. If you're like me when you read the Bible, you like to picture how they sounded like. <clears throat> Actually, it was, it was some ladies. So, give us your oil. Our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, no. Lest there should be. No, I'm not going to do that. Lest there should not be enough for us and you. But you go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, say ready, went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins, when they got back from Costco, came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. But we're, we're virgins. We, 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 are, we, we want to be married to the bridegroom. What's going on? And then he ends with, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. And as I read this, it was, um, it was loving and, and sobering at the same time. Because not everyone says that their Christian is going to be with the Lord. You realize, we all realize this, right? Like not, and that's, that's the urgency that I really think that, and know that God has put in my heart for the people, that we have to be careful. And there's more than just saying, I'm a, I'm a Christian, because he's looking for disciples, not a one-time decision maker. Right? And, um, you know, we can go over tons of bi Bible verses that would seem to deter the general public from wanting to follow Jesus Christ. It's called most of the Bible. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, as I read this, there was just some certain things that I really felt in my spirit that just need to be said. And the first one is that nasty C word. Correction. I know all of you just went, Ugh. say it again. Correction. <laughs> Correction. How many of you like to be corrected? I mean... It, it's exactly what Christine just did. I'm going to raise it halfway because it hurts, but I know it's good in the end. Like, or just raise your left hand, Pat. I'm just playing. <laughs> Got to come every week to get all that joke. Um, so correction. And, and here's just, I, I really pray you hear my heart. This is not condemning, but it will be convicting, and conviction is good. Condemnation is the enemy using your past sins against you for your future. Conviction is the Holy Spirit dealing with us in our present sin because he loves us. Yeah. And so the first thing that we have to know about correction, whether it's God and his Holy Spirit to you, whether God uses your mentor, whether God uses your friend, or whether God uses an unbeliever to help co correct a behavior that's in you that might not be what the word says you need to be. Amen? Anybody have an unbeliever call them out on some behavior? <laughs> you don't even believe, but it's like, still, I need to be corrected. I mean, amen, that's, it's tough. So, so listen to this. The first thing is that your motive of correction. What is the motive that God set for correction, right? Uh, in Hebrews 12, 6, and in Proverbs 3, 12, the Bible simply says that God corrects those he loves. God corrects those he loves. God corrects those are who, are, are who his sons and daughters are. And so this is the, the loving um, thought, the convicting, wonderful part of this, is that, you know, all of the, the, the virgins probably, you know, I picture all of them go, yeah, yeah we're Christians, we're ready, um, but they weren't ready. <laughs> and scripturally, oil speaks of the Holy Spirit. You know, those who are not born again in the Spirit will not inherit the kingdom of God, Right? And so when I, when I thought about this, I just thought, you know, first, correction is good and that your motive should be out of love. And if God, and listen to this, God corrects those who are his. We need to be very worried about ourselves or others if we say we are his, but we have no conviction from his spirit when we're doing something contrary to his word. If I'm his, he corrects me. And if you're a parent, you get this beyond a normal comprehension. 
It's because I love you, my son or my daughter, that I discipline you, whether it's a timeout, whether it's a little pat on the bum, whether it's um, taking something away from them. Discipline is healthy. And we live in this mamby-pamby culture that says, I'm offended, don't correct me. (laughs) So catch that. That in my life, because I'm not perfect, there's something beautiful. And I kind of relate it to like when you, um, like your parents, and if something comes on TV that's just completely anti-God, completely anti-anything that that he wants you to be involved in, (laughs) and we're watching this movie, and uh, your mom and your grandma are watching it with you. How does that feel? Most of us would go, this is why we stopped letting the kids pick the shows. I'm so sorry. I mean, you know what I mean? We start blaming other people. But it's like the same thing that when, when, when God loves you so much that in the midst of your life as you're living this life and you're doing something against him, there should be this like grievance in our spirit of like, oh man, Paul said it when he's like, why do I do these things I don't want to do? Lord, I don't want to to hurt your heart. You're my father. And I believe he corrects us a lot of times through his Holy Spirit. And he says, not, come on, not you. You're set apart. Come on. And it's not to condemn, it's to convict because godly sorrow leads to repentance and repentance leads to turning away from my old habit and into a new habit. I mean, you know what I mean? So when we say we are Christian... It's important to, to, to get ready, uh, to be ready, and to stay ready, right? And so that's, that's the first point of the correction is that the motive should be out of love. And so many times there's such a lack of correction amongst church people because we're afraid of a couple things that we shouldn't be afraid of, okay? <laughs> I love, these, are, these are some to-dos that if you are corrected by another believer or whatever that we shouldn't do. You ready for this one? I'll use Warren as an example. Come on up here, Warren. None of, the, none of the facts are true in the story. No one was hurt in the making of this sermon. But I'm really going to try to make this black and white so you get it. Okay. <laughs> Everyone went online like, <gasps> Warren and I travel a lot together. We do a lot of prison ministry together. So um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, That's good. Okay, so if I'm correcting another believer, right, I don't do it out of religion, right? I don't say, stop doing that. How dare you? (laughs) But if I love Warren, if I love Warren and I truly love him with, with, just read your Bible. How many times does it say that we are to love each other with a brotherly love, a godly love that's just like, man, I care about you. And I want the best for you because God is molding you and he wants to complete the work he started in you and he wants you to walk in everything that he has for you and he might use me in his life to help cut something off or to, uh, to, to, to correct him or to say, man, we don't do that, Warren. You know what I mean? Like God might use a brother or sister and what happens if your motive is love so many times, here's what you shouldn't do on the other end. If Warren goes... That's great that you pointed that out. Um, But you did this yesterday, so I don't receive your correction. We get so defensive and so like, well, you did that. Well, you did that and you did that. But even the Bible says, man, the truth that just that may hurt from an enemy is better than kisses of a friend. Like, I don't want to, to let sin in my life and then, some, and then get some kind of hurt or, or injury and then people coddle me and they never help correct me. If I'm walking around with a dislocated shoulder, I want someone to come up and be like, bam, that hurt. But later in life, I'm going to be so thankful when I go, wow, something's just good. And as a pastor, what I see in our church and I see everywhere as believers is people have a hard time taking correction. And I think there's so many factors to this because, one, I believe that some motives are wrong. Like, your, our motive should be God's motive. God corrects those he loves. If I love my brother, then I'm able to correct my brother. But something happens, like, within church. We go, well, I don't want to correct someone unless, you know, they're like, you know, because, and I get this, because I, I, this all has to come with discernment. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
I'm talking about our family. This is a family conversation right now. I'm not telling you to go out into a public and keep someone accountable to stuff they don't even believe, okay? I'm talking like our family, our church, and just some tips and tricks that, that God, and, and tools that God has given us to help correct each other and some attitudes and different things to stay away from and to be thankful. Because I kind of look at it this way. If Warren was like, man, I'm going to write an essay and I want to win this competition and I just want this essay to be perfect. I just want it to have no mistakes and I want it to just bless those who read it, blah, 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 blah. And Warren, and, and, I, and he, see, he, he almost had, there has to be this permission that takes place of, man, I love and trust you enough as a mentor of mine or someone who's discipling me to, hey, read my paper. And how bad would it be if I read the paper and I don't correct all of the misspellings and all of the things that are wrong and I give it back to him and say it's good, all to find out in the end it gets rejected for the mistakes that I could have corrected yeah. and helped. Like, as a believer, if you truly wanted the best for him and to, to succeed in that, then there's a way to say, hey, brother, I just, I just caught this, and I know that, that you want this to be perfect, and I know that you want this to, to do these things, so I, I would just help fix this, um, this, this, and this. Relationship, when it precedes correction, is a beautiful thing. I think it's more received. But the problem is, if you don't have relationship, then there's not much correction equity. But if you're friends with people and you have relationship in our church and, and our, our, our pastors here are praying that there's, there's a culture in this place that there's able to be correction. Amen? Correction, not out of religion, but correction out of, I want the best for you. And I want you to be a bride who is ready with their oil, not a bride who's not ready with the oil. Because we all say we are Christian, but man, if you are discipling anyone there should be enough fear of the Lord, which is like, hey, I'm just a, Lord, I don't want to live life without you. I don't want to go into the promised land if, you're, if I don't have your spirit with me, like a fear of not having the Lord with you, right? And so it's so important that, and, and give it up for Warren. Um, but I, I help, I help. So my motive is out of love, and there's a relationship before correction happens. And I'm not going to pinpoint every little thing today because how many of you guys know there's a lot to correction? There's a lot to advice and to wisdom and to relationships and brother to brother. I mean, I can tell you that the disciples even rebuked and corrected each other, right? So, well, so what's the next thing? So I love this because the Bible gives us like this framework of what we should do. And check this out. So Matthew 18, 15 through 17, I'm going to say this which is kind of contrary to what other people believe, but I believe this is how it is, is that the Bible doesn't say, if your brother sins against you, then go and tell their leader. Right? You hear that? If your brother or your sister sins against you, then go and tell their leader. Um, I love Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Moreover, if your brother or your sister sins against you, then you go and tell him or her his or her fault between you and him alone, the scripture says. Unless it's guy, girl, then I'm going to suggest you take two. Okay? I mean, that's just... But, but if my brother or my sister sins against me, then go tell him or her their fault and, and alone. This is a beautiful thing. And so many times um, people will tell me, it's like, we, we, like some of us, we say certain things, but we don't walk in the truth that we say. Does that, that make sense? And then it corrects us, and we go, you're right. I preach that every week. I need to do that. Like, I, I ain't scared to tell you even as a pastor I get corrected in all kinds of ways and forms. And I go, you're right. That's how it needs to be done. And what the enemy tries to do is to get you out of order when the Spirit wants you in order. And uh, as a pastor, I literally deal with this uh, every day. I mean, not just in church, but even out of, out of the building. We deal with this in relationships, right, where we lovingly correct each other. And I thought, man, that's so interesting that, so one of, the, one of the tips and things with you guys with correction is be careful not to slam someone in public, right? Like if your brother sinned against you, um, you know, then stay off Instagram <laughs> or, or anything because it could be hurtful. I mean, that's the truth. That's correction. If I get hurt... If Glenn Wooten, can I tell that story? Because that's so funny. <laughs> okay, so I have to tell this story. So uh, Glenn Wooten calls Pastor John. He goes like, hey, dude, you got a dumpster. I'm trying to use it. And I was like, okay, I'll let you use it. Go ahead and dump some stuff in there. And then uh, <laughs> Glenn was like, fill her up. 
filled that thing up with tile. And uh, so then the garbage company was like, well, okay, I'm not going to pick up your garbage can because my truck can't even lift it. And then the tra trash kept picking up and piling up, piling up, piling up. And I'm like, and then the daycare owner was like, Pastor John, can you call the trash company? I said, yeah. I said, trash company, what's up? Where you at? Well, we came like five, six times. The truck couldn't pick it up. It's too heavy. I go, well, what are you guys going to do about it? They're like, no, what are you going to do about it? It's your trash can. Like, you need to offload the tile, and then we'll come pick it up. I'm like, what do you mean, offload the tile? <laughs> and this is such a beautiful thing within our little family and our church, is I called, I called Warren. I called my backup, my backup, sorry. I called my backup, and I called Daniel, Daniel Attendee. Thank you, Ransom, for raising a good boy. I called Daniel Attendee. I called Warren. I said, I'm going to pay you guys' as lunch if you help me do something. Yeah, dude, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are we doing? Man, you'll find out. It's good, man. <laughs> it's all good. Bro. I argue with the trash company like 30 minutes. Like, please, Lord, if there's anything you can do, get a bigger truck. Yeah. Have two trucks pick it up. I don't know. Work it out. I got stuff to do today. It's Thursday. And we're not in the office on Friday. I just see the headline. Senior pastor dumpster dives for two hours. But anyway, so then I called Glenn. I was like, Hey, man, I got some bad news, you know. So remember the stuff you put in the dumpster? Um, <clears throat> apparently, they don't like that. So <laughs> and Glenn's like, man, he just kind of knew it. He's like, I'm going to take off work. And so he brought his kids, and uh, Peggy was like, you guys are nasty. She went and bought some gloves for us. And then me, Warren, Daniel, and Glenn were in our dumpster Thursday for two and a half hours. Now, there's trash and there's like daycare trash. You understand me? <laughs> yeah, you get what I'm saying? Like I can tell you as your friend and your pastor, I spent Thursday doing the most humble thing I've ever done in my life. And you know, metaphorically, I'm always dealing with people's trash, but this was different. This hit different. And, and Glenn's so funny because he's like, hey man, um, don't kick me out of the church, okay? Um, <laughs> So, God bless you, God bless your son, God bless America. That was crazy. But, you know, the thing that's so beautiful is a recognition of like, hey, man, I'm, I'm sorry. He's like, you know, I dropped that first load off, and then I kind of figured I shouldn't have dumped that second load because it was looking a little heavy. And it was beautiful because in the correction, it's, you know, correction in and of itself is not a big deal, but we make it a big deal with our emotions, and we get not sober-minded, and we start making it a big deal. Because you know what I could have done? Glenn, you trash man. You little, ah, uh, you chunky dunker. You, <laughs> ah, I could have got mad. I could have got upset. I could have got angry. I could have got all kinds of things. But the, the Bible, man, I, you got to take joy in tribulations and things that come your way. So I said, man, let's dumpster dive. And we had a good attitude until you pick up some bags and you're like, I don't, what? I haven't talked to the daycare. You need to clean up your trash more. I want less filthy trash, more clean trash, okay? But it was just a beautiful thing between brothers of like, man, I made a mistake. I owned up to it. And we move forward and we move on. Oh, what a beautiful thing it is, right? When we can just say, I messed up, I'm going to correct it, let's move on, and let's move ahead. Like, it's just a beautiful thing for all of us, right? Because this literally affects every single person in our church. This literally will come up, because you'll be, you'll be with each other, and we'll be discipling each other, and these things will come up. So, the Bible says that you go to your brother alone, and you tell them their fault. And what do I mean by fault? In ministry, it's all kinds of things. It just so happens that God blessed me with communication skills. I love communication. I love how God made people. In Romans 12, he gave different people gifts. Some people are better at exhortation. Some people are better at teaching. Some people are better at prophesying. Some people are better at this and better at that. And we are this beautiful melting pot of gifts, personalities that further the kingdom of God. Amen? And so, I'm not, and so when we correct things, here, here's what can be selfish. We don't correct something that's not wrong, right? Because how many of you guys have heard this in church? I love you. I just don't like you. Has you ever heard that? Like that happens. It's a real thing. But at the same time, there's things that we can lovingly do for each other and with each other. You know, like one of the, one of the 
favorite portions of Scripture is in Galatians, where it says, if your brother's trapped in sin, you who are spiritual, to go and gently restore your brother and help him pull out of that mess, not condemn them, train them up and disciple them and help pull them up out of the mess, right? So going to our brother or our sister alone, and then the other thing with correction is I love this. I absolutely love this. There's an, there's a, we went to prison ministry, right? And in prison, there was this dude, so much zeal. You know what zeal is? It's when you give your kids a bunch of sugar. That's zeal after what happens. You give it to them. There's fire and there's zeal. And they run around and they get crazy. So this dude had gotten saved, like gave his heart to Jesus with all of him and believed in Jesus. And uh, it had only been a week, right? Like the cool tattoos and all. I just don't have big enough arms for anything cool. And he got on the microphone, and sometimes, you, don't, you know, when you give someone a microphone, you're like, the Lord, we pray right now. Don't say anything stupid. Just please, Lord. This is the same prayer that my wife prays many weeks in a row. Lord, <laughs> the mic is his. Bless him, Lord. Help him. Be his mouth. So this dude gets up, and listen, a religious spirit could have happened, because this dude, out of his zeal, got up on the microphone to a bunch of in inmates and goes, change your beeping life. He's awesome. Wow. And we're like, <laughs> and to be truthful, I mean, everyone's like, oh, my oh. And I'm like watching, like, do I grab the microphone? What are we doing? Someone said a bad word. I don't know what knows what to do. And I thought about this. This is so powerful. Imagine people who would spend more time thinking that, man, I want to disciple you instead of judging you to get out because you are not at a certain level. Come on. What if we spent more time saying, man, I love your zeal. You are a baby Christian, and I'm going to help walk you into maturity with reading your word, praying, worshiping. I'm going to take time to teach you instead of being like, get out of here. You said a bad word. Woo! I mean, if we would just take time to think that way of like, man, I'm going to disciple you because I see some immaturity in your life based on your words and your actions, right? The same scripture, a portion of scripture that says do not judge a little bit further says you're going to know people by their fruit. I know I have a baby at home because she goes, bye-bye, bye-bye, right? I can really know some, where someone is in their walk with God based on what they say and the fruit that they're showing, and if we would just have the mindset to be like, oh, I'm going to disciple you. I'm telling you, God is doing a big work in discipleship in this church. People are growing and maturing in the Lord, and it's tough and it hurts, but they're growing. And it takes sometimes those hard moments in your life or with your children or with friends or with your mentors, and it doesn't feel good. But if you just commit to keep going forward and trusting in Jesus that he's, he's perfecting that work that he started in you right? And it ended well because with that brother who said that bad word, um, yeah, and who wants to be the one to correct that guy? Wait, what are you in for? Murder? Aha! Who? I don't know if I should be the one to correct him, but man, there was a beautiful thing that took place with this other inmate who was further in his walk with God. He's like, brother, I appreciate your zeal, man. God is going to use you for mighty things. And he just began to share scripture with him because I want you to hear this. When you correct someone, it shouldn't be from some weird philosophy. It should be from the word of God, right? In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. So make sure if we go to correct somebody that it's rooted in the word of God, not your personal preferences. There are like a million ways to do church. Not right or wrong, just different right? Like there's 85 churches right now having church, and it's, it looks 85 different ways, right? And so a lot of times it's not right or wrong, it's just different. So when we correct something, let's make sure it's rooted in a motive for love, and let's make sure it's rooted in scripture, and not just, well, I don't like how this person does this. Everyone do that. That's just fun to do. You online, let me see you. Mm. We all like to do that, and it's just like, come on. So, Correction, it's good. It hurts, but it's good. And I think when done right, it's your benefit and you'll grow. And the second thing from this parable that I really thought was, man, get ready, be ready, and stay ready. They weren't ready when the bridegroom came. 
They just weren't ready. They didn't have the oil. And I just think about like correction. Could you imagine if, if, if like the wise virgins just looked over and said, hey, did you guys didn't bring oil? You guys, you get oil. Like I just think about what could have happened with that subtle little like correction in the story that if you just would have done that. And then when I think get ready, be ready, stay ready, how do I get ready? By putting my faith in Jesus. I hear so many people now out there, I'm a, man of, I'm a person of faith. Faith in what? Faith in who? I mean, there's some weird stuff out there, right? Man, but I put my faith, I love that song, I put my faith in Jesus. Okay, never mind. I thought Brett would back me up on that, but I guess not. <laughs> so let's keep going. So be ready, and, and to get ready, and stay ready. There's a sense of urgency that needs to be happening, and I'm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with this story. I took an uh, excerpt. Is that how you say it? Excerpt? Excerpt. I took a story from this book I read, and I want to read it to you because it talks about the sense of urgency. Do you know the Bible says that we don't know the day or the hour that Jesus is coming back? You need to live with a sense of urgency as a Christian, as a Christ follower, and say, man, I need to share the gospel with as many people as I can because I don't know the day or the hour that he's coming, but I'm going to stay ready. I have the same principle with my children. Do you know that none of us know the day or the hour that we're going to die? And with that principle, I want to make sure that I always am living in every moment present with my children, pouring into them and loving them because I don't want to pass away because I don't know my day or my hour that I'm going to pass away. But I just want them to always know how much they're loved, how much I care for them. Anyone understand? It's like that same principle with Jesus coming for us. We don't know the day or the hour, so we've got to stay ready. And then I, I heard this story. It was from John Corson's commentary. It's so good. He said, there, and this is that sense of urgency, right? He says, there's a story of a meeting that Satan held with his demons. And they were trying to figure out how to trick people into eternal damnation. And one demon said, hey, I got a plan. Let's just whisper in people's ear that there's no God. And Satan was like, no, no. Creation, I love this, declares the reality of God. People are too smart to deny his existence. A few idiots might get sucked in, but not the masses. Then another demon said, I got it. Let's just say that there's no hell. No, said Satan. People innately understand the need for retribution and judgment. People won't buy that. A third demon had said, let me suggest how we might trick them. Instead of saying that there's no God or no hell, let's just say there's no hurry. Satan looked and said, that's it. He said it gleefully. He commissioned his demons to go throughout the world, whispering to people that there's no hurry. Man. And then I read 2 Peter 1.10, and I think, man, so many people have just lost their urgency or their sense of urgency. But the cry will soon go forward. The bridegroom cometh. The bridegroom is here. And so we have to give and I love First P- Second Peter uh, one ten. Give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. In other words, don't miss the wedding. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team up because, like Pat said, we never want to go a week that we don't give you a chance to get ready. Jesus, I love you with all my heart. I put my faith and my trust in you. You know, and to stay ready. I'm going to stay vigilant. I'm going to stay with a sense of urgency in my heart. And that sense of urgency is even when you go out into the world, the sense of urgency, the sense of I'm going to listen to the Lord to like talk to my friend at school or on the basketball court. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Or anywhere that you are, getting, being ready to share and have those opportunities. And man, the, the, the things that God has given us in this day and age to communicate to people. You know what I mean? Like 20 years ago, we couldn't reach people all over the world, and we can right now. Like, we're streaming and broadcasting all over the world, and it's crazy. And that's only been in the last, like, 20 years. Like, and look at, look at uh, all the different technology in our communication with all these. These are so many different ways to spread the gospel that there wasn't 20 years ago. And we should take full advantage of what God's given us. Amen? And I am going to be doing another sermon on um, Bridezilla Part 4, and I'm going to wrap it up with Part 4. 
because I want to dive into some more practical things, more practical ways, like from believer to believer, of things like correction, things like getting wisdom from, from godly people, and who we surround ourselves with to get that advice. Because the Bible says, and you guys know it, people are going to spend a day, or there's a day coming where people are going to go wherever that's going to tickle their ear. And how I take that is people are going to look for a, a group of people that are not going to tell them the truth. They're going to tell them what they want to hear. And like as a Christian, there's certain things in our world, in our society, that more churches are caving into because they're not standing on the truth of God's word. And as you stand on the truth of God's word, you're going to get persecution. You're going to get people that are like, oh, you're this and you're that. And, and it's like all my friends that are out there that struggle with sin, like I get it. You, you don't get to choose what you're tempted with, but you do get to choose how you respond to the temptation. And so I get around with my friends. I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't hate anybody. I just hate evil. And, uh, and, and I'll end with this. Give me some music. Give me that backup music. There it is. Is, is this. And this, this is like, this is me and Glenn and, 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 and Joyce and, and, and Jesus and Judy. Like us as pastors. Like one thing that, that I'm going to do this summer is like I'm going to intensely in the spirit pray for you and when I see like different things happen in your life like with all of my heart I just hate that there's just evil just running rampant just those demons that are trying to whisper there's no God you have no hope you're worthless and I'm just like I just want to break it off of people and in the spirit we just have been dedicated to just let's pray and it's good to see you, by the way, Miss Abby. It's just good to just, God will put some of you in my mind, and I just, I feel like I just go to war, and I just, like, get off my friend. And you just pray, like, who you are in Christ and stand up. Because what some of the, sometimes us church people, listen, we can be the worst. Because we're waiting for, like, someone will mess up, and they'll go to church, and they'll mess up. And then church people, without even realizing it, will condemn that person. And that person feels like now I got to get to where I was to even come back in this church. And like the heart of God is like, man, let me just like gently and, and humbly reach out my hand and just pull you out of that stuff. And let me just pour into you what God has poured into me. That's discipleship. Amen. And if you stand up, everyone stand up with me. We're going to do a couple things. If you've just never got ready, come and ask Jesus into your life. If you need to just make sure, listen, I'd rather have someone come to this altar 50 times for salvation than end up in hell, okay? Like, there's an urgency, right? And so, like, if you just say, man, I just need to get right, but even this, this, this morning, if you're just like, man, I just need to repent because I've, I've, I've went down the slope and I'm not feeling conviction from, his, from the Holy Spirit and I want to be corrected. I want him to love me so much that he disciplines me and corrects me and, and just makes me better, makes me more of his, and, and I have a deeper relationship with him. So that's you. Also, come up here. And some of you, just straight up, you just need to come to this altar and lay down whatever's bugging you, whatever God, whatever the enemy's just whispering to you. Like, this is the essence of church, to come and pray together so that you may be healed. So, and you guys come up to pray with some people too. So I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up. And we're going to spend some time just ministering and worshiping and just glorifying Jesus. Amen. Father God, we love you. I praise you. I humbly just say that I, I'm yours. And I believe in you wholeheartedly with all of my heart, mind, and strength. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We give you this room. Thank you for ministering to your children. Thank you for bringing correction and conviction. Lord, thank you for making us the wise virgin who, who has their oil and is eagerly ready to go out and meet the bridegroom to let the wedding feast and celebration begin, God. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we said.
What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Come on, give him glory this morning. He's worthy.
It's exciting to praise, but what's really exciting is when you watch the walls fall that you've been praying for, things that you've been believing for. When you see God's answer to prayer, that's what that's what's really exciting. So let's just join together and just just put that thing in your mind. Whatever you've been praying for, whatever you've been asking for, let's just let's declare victory over that as we sing this. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him I with all creation cry. God, we praise you. Sing it again. 
We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him by. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, Jesus, we praise you. We praise you. declare victory over every obstacle that stands in the face of worship to you, Lord. God, in this place, we declare victory. The gates of hell will not stand against your church, God. We declare victory, and God, we pray for every person that has a need this morning, and we just stand with them and say, victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to end the service. And we're going to continue to worship. I love that the dance is happening, but if you have to go, you're welcome to go. Um, but if not, we'll just continue to worship. <laughs>